I'm currently reading the book Masters of the Air, written by Donald L. Miller. This book is the basis for an upcoming miniseries of the same name to accompany Band of Brothers and the Pacific. I wanted to share a section of the book that covers the exploits of a man named Maynard Harrison Smith, the recipient of a Medal of Honor for his actions. The section of the book reads as follows. Maynard Harrison Smith was with the first group of replacements to arrive that spring, and at age 32, he was one of the oldest. The son of a small-town judge, he styled himself a debater and frequented the pubs around the base, arguing politics with the locals. Back on base, he was forever in trouble, known to his hutmates as a real fuck-up. Smith went on his first raid on May 1st, 1943. His veteran pilot was Lieutenant Lewis Page Johnson, and Smith, filling in for another man, was assigned to the ball turret, even though he had never before flown in the glass bubble. Coming back from St. Nazaire, the group sighted land and started to descend. The visibility was lousy, but we were pretty happy, the co-pilot later described the scene in the plane. All of a sudden, there was a terrific crossfire of flak. Wham, 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 and we were in the middle of it. They were not over England. A navigator's error had brought them over the U-boat base at Brest. Moments later, they were attacked by a swarm of FW-190s that came ripping through the haze. William Farenhold, the top turret gunner, came down and said that there was a hell of a fire in the back of the ship. The interphone was shot out, so Johnson ordered him to go back and appraise the damage. When Johnson opened the forward radio compartment door, a solid wall of fire stopped him in his tracks. The ammunition was exploding, and I saw Smith walking through the fire with shell casings bouncing off his parachute harness. Just before this, Smith had crawled out of his turret and found himself bestride two angry fires, both closing in on him. Sheets of flame were coming out of the radio room, and there was another fire in the rear section. Suddenly, the radio operator came staggering out of the flames, Smith later told Rooney. He made a beeline for the gun hatch and dived out. I glanced out and watched him hit the horizontal stabilizer, the plane's tail, bounce off and open his chute. Seconds later, the two waste gunners bailed out. Interviewed later, the pilot said he couldn't understand why Smith stayed. With the smoke and gas fumes making it almost impossible for him to breathe, Smith wrapped a sweater around his face, grabbed a fire extinguisher, and went to attack the fire in the radio room. Glancing over my shoulder at the tail fire, I thought I saw something coming and ran back. It was Roy H. Gibson, the tail gunner, painfully crawling back, wounded. He had blood all over him. Looking him over, I saw that he'd been hit in the back, and that it had probably gone through his left lung. I laid him down on his left side so the blood would not drain into the right lung, and gave him a shot of morphine. The first aid kits on American bombers were equipped with single injection morphine vials. Crewmen were taught to break off the glass casing and feed the morphine into the nerve system of a wounded man by squeezing the tiny tube. It was difficult for Smith to do this with fire and freezing wind filling the plane and with the wounded man wearing heavy clothing. After stabilizing Gibson, Smith went back to the fires. Just then, a focke wolf returned to finish off his fortress. I jumped for one of the waste guns and fired at him, then went back to the radio room fire again. I got into the room this time and began throwing out burning debris. The fire had burned holes so large in the side of the ship that I just tossed the stuff out through them. Gas from a burning extinguisher was choking me, so I went back to the tail fire. I took off my chute so I could move easier. I'm glad I didn't take it off sooner, because later I found that it had stopped a 30 calibre bullet. After emptying the last extinguisher, Smith urinated on the fire and tried to smother it with his hands and feet 
until his gloves and boots began to smoulder. That FW came round again and I let him have it. That time he left us for good. The fire was under control, more or less, and we were in sight of land. Smith knelt down and tried to comfort the wounded tail gunner. He told him that they were home clear, but he knew the tail wheel was gone and feared the shock of landing would break the fortress in half. The stubby gunner had fought the fire and the enemy alone for an hour and 15 minutes. The full ammunition cans he tossed out of the plane weighed 100 pounds, just 30 pounds less than he did. With the bombers flying in close formation, the crew of the ship on Johnson's left wing, piloted by Captain Raymond J. Check, had witnessed the scene. We saw Smith going past the open waste through the flames to help the tail gunner. We could see the ammunition inside his ship exploding through the openings above and at the side of the radio compartment. We could see him fighting the fire and then stopping to fight off attacking enemy pilots. All this was done with the wind blowing the flames over him. That he did not lose his life by these actions is a matter entirely with his creator. When the battle-tough fortress landed on an emergency field near Land's End, the fuselage held. It was a miracle she didn't break in two, Smith told Air Force investigators. I wish I could shake hands personally with the people who built her. Snuffy's story was a dream come true for public relations officers, and his exploits were played up to the press to the hilt, wrote the 303rd's historian. Usually, a Medal of Honor recipient was sent home to receive his award from the President, but Secretary of War Stimson was touring the air bases, and the men, it was thought, would get a boost from seeing one of the sergeants receive the nation's highest award for bravery in combat. The day Stimson arrived in an eight-car caravan, Smith was nowhere in sight. A search was quickly organised, and he was found in the mess kitchen peeling potatoes. He had been assigned to KP duty for coming in late after a pass, and had forgotten what time he was expected to show up for the ceremony. He was, said his citation, an inspiration to the armed forces of the United States. But the boys who knew him, said Rooney, never stopped thinking of him as a fuck-up. Maybe so, but this dour screw-up from Cairo, Michigan, had performed what his pilot called an act of complete self-sacrifice. Thank you.